I'm in honor to be here on this auspicious day of celebrating the ministry both of the National Cathedral and Reverend Gina Campbell. The response to God's call to live as one human family is expressed well here within the ecumenical world as well as it within the multi-faith world. Gina has and will continue to embody this her calling, and especially as a United Methodist for which we are so proud. And yours as the congregation, your belief and hope in this new world is highly commendable and to be affirmed. Gina, thank you for your witness and for all of your faithfulness. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your father's house to the land that I will show you. The text is about the journey that we all share. Each faith family has its own history and narrative and ways of telling the story. But it is God's story, and it is our story. It is a pivotal story of God calling us, Jews, Christians, Muslims, through Abraham and Sarah. It is about our spiritual journey, and poetry, more than geography, helps us find the way. There is an older monk Killian McDonnell, who now at the age of 75, whose vocation in life's work was as a theologian and a scholar of Catholic decrees and papal encyclicals and Episcopal pronouncements, who lives in a community at St. John's Abbey in Minnesota. He decided at the age of 75 to devote the rest of his life to writing poetry. In his collection of poems entitled, Lord, Swift You Are Not, he offers this poem. It is his argument with God. He says, talk about imperious without a may I presume, no previous contact, no letter of introduction, this unknown God issues edicts. This is not a conversation. Am I a nobody to receive decrees from one whose name I do not know? I have worshiped my own God. To you I have addressed no prayers, but quick, like sudden fire in the desert, I hear, go. At 75, am I supposed to scuttle my life and place my arthritic bones upon the road to some mumbled nowhere? Let me get this straight. I will be brief. I summarize. In 10 generations since the flood, you have spoken to no one. Now like thunder on a clear day, you give commands, pull up my tent, desert the graves of my ancestors, leave Haran for a country you do not name, there to be a stranger? And it is. Much like Abraham and Sarah, today's lesson is about the journey into the new country. The call, the invitation, the command, is into an unknown world for which we do not know the name, where we will be strangers. On the journey across faith lines and into new territory, how do we travel into this world we do not know, of new friends, with unexpected communities, unknown rituals, unfamiliar practices, curious words, strange signs, uncommon or no symbols, unexplored conversations? What are the gestures? What are the prayers? 
What are the actions? What are the movements? Where are the spaces that are reserved only for the observers? And as outsiders, what can we do and what can we not do? Many years ago, I went to Emory University to be the Dean of the Chapel in Religious Life. The inaugural service was an interfaith service. Being a good Methodist, from which the Mother Church is Anglican, I was tutored well in tolerance and respect. I was very well intentioned and naive. To the planning meeting with the rabbi, a Muslim leader, a Hindu priest, and a Buddhist, in good Anglo-Western style Protestant fashion, I brought a well-prepared outline. We did not really know each other, and we were cautiously interested in this experiment of trying on interfaith work. Most of all, we did not want to hurt each other's feelings, and we were burdened with many histories and narratives of ourselves and of one another. At one point, I asked what symbol each tradition might bring to the service. Very quickly, the rabbi looked at me and said, we cannot live with the cross because of the suffering that symbol has brought to Jews. The Muslim turned and said, we cannot live with the Star of David. The Hindu priest said, we can live with most anything. And the Buddhist said nothing. <laughs> each was quintessentially him or herself. Each was trying to be faithful to his or her tradition and faith, while at the same time, figuring out how to be authentically together. It was one of the most important lessons I learned during those 22 years. And I know you're wondering what were the symbols. Just so you know, we had water and wheat and light and sacred texts and bells. These colleagues became dear friends, and the relationships were quite extraordinary. Over the years, I and we learned so much. Our relationships grew and flourished, and our communities benefited. We each were able to claim our own authentic faith, identity, and voice, and to be together in times of sorrow and advocacy and peace building. The Genesis story is God calling Abraham and Sarah to leave their kin who were worshiping idols, the land, their ancestral cultural traditions for a brand new world. We do share in common the call of God to leave the place where we are secure, to abandon our idols, to loosen our ancestral ties, to go to a new place. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael will go ahead of us to watch over us on the journey. This past Thursday, the Islamic Society of North America held a conference here in D.C. Rabbi Pesner of the Religious Action Council reminded us that when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, and Abraham said, which son? And finally God said, I love both of my sons, Ishmael and Isaac. God does not want any of God's children sacrificed. All of our children should be raised to live in peace, to share creation, and to journey together. 
from a little book, The Art of Pilgrimage, I offer a couple of insights. On this journey, there will be sites, S-I-T-E-S, and sightings. The sites will be the National Cathedral, mosques, synagogues, and holy places, Jerusalem, and Mecca. And there will be sightings. We will go to places we have never been to see things that are quite unexpected. We will be tempted to value the site by the location or size or history or vibrancy, beauty, and a sense of belonging. But the issue is not as much about the site as it is about the sightings. With whom will we travel? Who will be our companions and fellow pilgrims? Who will we really let ourselves see? With whom will we stand? The journey is as much about the fellow pilgrims, what we see and with whom we stand, as it is about the place. And then, there was a story in the Irish Times by a man from Connie Morrow after he was arrested for a car accident. He said, there were plenty of onlookers, but no witnesses. We can go many places and do many things, but see very little. If we become witnesses on the journey, we will cast our eyes very differently. We will have to decide whether to be onlookers or witnesses to the stories of strangers and fellow pilgrims. We will have to listen to and hold those who are in pain and those who suffer if we are to be witnesses. Our call is to be witnesses to the lives of those who mourn, the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers. We will need to be witnesses to the lives and stories of others and then to go and tell what we have seen and heard. Years ago, a woman from Eastern Europe was given an opportunity to come to the States and to visit Disneyland and Universal Studios. Having lived under an authoritarian government, she declined, saying that she wanted to break away from the group to go to Sproul Hall at the University of California, Berkeley, where Mario Savio had inspired the free speech movement. She said, I wanted to go to a place where people stopped a war. On this journey, the Holy One will find us. There will be many parts of this multi-faith journey. There will be cold nights and mistaken identities and strange food and prayers we do not understand. But fellow pilgrims will appear and the sacred will find us. The Holy One will be there. We will have to be watchful in unexpected places. We will be tempted to allow the insignificant to become significant. We will be tempted to be drawn into small worlds and to forget to keep an eye out for the whole world. We will be tempted to hold on only to our own narrative. We will resist being humble and submitting to God's will. But God's story is given to us all, those who claim Judaism and Christianity and Islam. And God will come to us and lead us into this new world where we can care for children on the border, stop gun violence, end racism, eradicate poverty, 
tear down walls and remember and desire and hunger for the tree of life and the garden of peace. We will need to cast our sights both to a global world as well as to our very local community. And if we neglect either, the people and the community will suffer. The brokenness of people is tied to a larger world of hurt and dysfunction. When someone cannot get health care, she needs us to advocate for her. Understanding and finding joy in the global and the local is our work. God will be there, so be watchful. As people of faith on this journey, we are set apart for the work of love and righteousness and justice. We are not set apart because we're special. As people of faith, we are set apart for greater responsibility to love and to be righteous and to be just. Going from our own country, we are called to this special work. And all of our traditions are committed to the work of healing and restoration, advocating for people on the margins, advocating for people living in poverty and those suffering with addiction and young men with no hope who are bound for a prison system that is horribly broken and greedy and remarkably uncommitted to restorative justice, and on and on. We must all direct our relationships and attention to those on the margins, and especially the poor. You know that almost half of the world, over three billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. And at least 80% of humanity lives on less than $10 a day. So now we're back to where we started, Abraham and Sarah. Here's the rest of the poem. God of the wilderness, from two desiccated lumps, from two parched prunes, you promise all peoples of the earth will be blessed in me. You come late, Lord, very late, but my camels leave in the morning. Blessings on us and our camels as we continue our journey listening for and letting God find us in this new and amazing country. Our camels leave in the morning so that we will be a blessing. <laughs>